Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Arts virtual lecture with an Egyptologist. This lecture is called uh, Flinders Petri and Golden Mummies, Race and Faces. My name is Maria Lopez, and I'm the manager of film and lecture programs. Thank you for joining us today. We are so happy to have so many people tuning in, and especially I, I saw in the chat some people turn, tuning in from the UK. Uh, that's exciting, and lots of locals as well. As well. Um, so this lecture is actually a program that's part of the North Carolina Museum of Arts exhibition programming for the uh, exhibition, Golden Mummies of Egypt. If you are in North Carolina, we do encourage you to safely come and visit the museum to view the exhibition. Uh, please be sure to note the museum's safety guidelines before you do. Um, and we would also like to encourage you to purchase your tickets in advance since they have been selling out for the weekends. Um, our lecture today will present and then we will have a short Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can enter them using the Q&A function or the chat. Uh, we will try to our best to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, we would like to know everyone, uh, let everyone know that the lecture will be recorded and made available on the NCMA YouTube page. And we will also be sharing the recording with you via email. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the NCMA's Curator of Ancient Art and the Director of Research at uh, the museum, Caroline Rochelot, who will introduce her lecture for today. Welcome, Caroline. Well, thank you very much, Maria, for um, the introduction and also the great work that you've been doing on the Golden Mummies lecture um, series. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Campbell Price to the NCMA for a second lecture in this wonderful um, series. And today his talk will focus on Flinders Petrie, the archaeologist who discovered the gilded mummies. Um, this is briefly touched upon in the last thematic section of the exhibition, but it is featured prominently in the accompanying catalog. Um, and I'll be making a shameless plug here. You have to get it because it is a fantastic catalog. Um, and it's a different kind of catalog as well, where it's not just a photo of the image and a description of the object. We're really diving into the meat of the various issues um, and it's lavishly illustrated. So I highly recommend it. I've read it um, twice already. So, uh, but continuing on to the topic of our lecture, um, commonly regarded as the father of Egyptian archeology, span Petrie was renowned for his scientific excavation methods, um, unlike most of his contemporaries, uh, but also for his interest in the more mundane objects of daily life again, like most of his peers. Um, what was often unknown or relegated to a footnote by his biographers uh, was the fact that Petrie was a proponent of eugenics. So in his examination of the exposed skulls of the mummies and the portraits uh, found at Hawara, P Petrie used prejudiced opinions to argue for racial uh, hierarchies. So that is what our speaker will be talking about today. And for those who don't know him um, yet, Dr. Price obtained his PhD in, two, in 2010 uh, from the University of Liverpool in the UK, where he is now an honorary research fellow. He has conducted field work at Zawiyat Um Al Rakam at Saqqara, has uh, worked also at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, he became in 2011 curator of Egyptian or of Egypt, sorry, and Sudan at Manchester Museum, which is part of the University of Manchester. As previously mentioned, uh, Dr. Price is the author of Golden Mummies of Egypt, uh, but he has also published widely on other topics related to ancient material culture and maintains special research interest in sculpture and the construction of ancient Egypt in museums. So for the second time, uh, Campbell, the floor is yours. Please tell us about Flinders Petrie's Flinders. It's a good thing I'm not the one giving a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Flinders Petrie, Golden Mummies, Races and Faces. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you for that great introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be back here again, albeit virtually. Um, I was just saying to, to Maria and to Caroline, I'm really sorry not to uh, 
be in town in Raleigh for the uh, exhibition um, because it seems to be sailing out every weekend, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, so as Caroline said, um, it's my great pleasure to curate the collection from which the exhibition is taken and to have um, worked on the exhibition for the last couple of years. I'm delighted it's in uh, North Carolina and is doing so well. So what I want to speak about um, following on from Caroline's very uh, useful introduction is one aspect of um, the interpretation of the material, but it's an important aspect. It's uh, footnoted and discussed at more length in the book. So if you've not got the book and you're interested after this lecture, uh, please, please do uh, contact the museum uh, to uh, source a copy. That is easier for people in North Carolina than it is for those in the UK. Uh, if you're in the UK, we still don't have an online shop at Manchester, but hopefully that will be remedied uh, soon. So the topic um, of my uh, presentation uh, today is um, of course related to the general subject of the exhibition, but it's hopefully a way of looking at the meanings that were imparted to these objects by the people who discovered them, notably Flinders Petrie himself. And as in a lot of things, Flinders Petrie's initial reaction, which inevitably was a product uh, of his, his upbringing, his uh, education, of his perspective on the world, like a lot of other aspects of Egyptology, it casts a very long shadow. If Petrie said something, it tends to stick. Now, this is not to um, denigrate Petrie's uh, significant contribution uh, to, to Egyptology, um, nor to cancel him in any way, but to nuance and to fully and uh, more fully understand um, his, him as a person and his influences uh, in his scholarship. So the reason really I'm, I'm talking about this is because the material um, in the exhibition all comes from the Manchester Museum collection. Manchester Museum is one of the largest, it is the largest, in fact, um, university uh, collection in the United Kingdom. It is uh, a very important, very significant collection of uh, material from, from Egypt, maybe the fifth largest in the UK at around 18,000 objects. And I'm very proud to say Manchester Museum has really led uh, UK museums um, in reconsidering the role of empire, the role of the imperial project, the British imperial project, in lots of different ways. Um, and often that imperial presence in Egypt is, is, is neglected. Uh, so, so I'm going to touch on that uh, today. And as it happens, actually, uh, today is a... Uh, unfortunately a, a significant day for this, uh, for considerations of royal funerary culture and non-royal funerary culture, because today, of course, uh, has just been in the UK, the funeral of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Also a chance to reconsider ideas about empire and the presentation of um, that British imperial project. That's why incidentally I'm wearing the black tie. And I have a gin and Duboni, a favoured royal drink at hand for afterwards. So let us look at this man, this bearded chap, um, probably in his 30s here. This is William Matthew Flinders Petrie, known widely as the father of Egyptian archaeology. He was extremely prolific uh, at many sites in Egypt, a self-taught uh, archaeologist. He didn't attend a university um, and often associated with University College London, a uh, major uh, university in the UK. He bequeathed uh, a lot of his material that he himself uh, acquired and collected uh, to University College London, and that is now known as the Petrie Museum, the second largest after the British Museum and collection of Egyptian archaeology. And so it's to Petrie, really, we uh, turn uh, for most of the material that is in the Golden Mummies uh, show. He excavated at one site in particular, the site of Hawara, uh, south of the Fayum region, uh, just uh, southwest of modern Cairo. And it's from that season, or rather three separate seasons, uh, that Manchester acquired one of the most significant uh, selections of Greco-Roman period material um, outside of Cairo itself. Just uh, a little bit of historical context, when I say Greco-Roman, I mean uh, the last three centuries BCE, Egypt under the Ptolemies, uh, Macedonian uh, kings, uh, 
and uh, the first uh, couple of centuries uh, CE, that is uh, Egypt under uh, the Roman Empire. And the reason Petrie is uh, so um, significant and is able actually to do uh, all his work uh, in, in Egypt or a lot of it, and certainly his work at Hawara is because of these two people. Now Petrie himself in his own account uh, kind of presents a situation where it's him single-handedly against the world. Uh, the Egyptian government don't appreciate him. The British government don't appreciate him. He just does, does it on his own with um, considerable lashings of daring do and um, intrepid explorer zeal. In fact, a recent chance to, to reread archive correspondence held at the Egypt Exploration Society in London um, revealed and confirmed perhaps uh, the fact that Petrie is not only a beneficiary of major significant uh, private funding, but that that funding was very carefully engineered and targeted uh, by the lady on the right. So the lady on the right, Amelia Edwards, is uh, the founder of the Egypt Exploration Fund, later society, uh, with whom Petrie is associated. But Petrie is a, at times irascible character and he falls out with the fund and then goes it uh, alone in Egypt and needs money to finance uh, excavations. Remember that Petrie is working at a time, the late 19th century, when excavations are large, much larger than, than, than most excavations today, and he employs hundreds of workers, men, women and children, Egyptian workers. And so it is <laughs> this bill that needs footing, which uh, prompts Amelia to really target Jesse Howarth. He is a very wealthy Manchester cotton merchant, um, grown rich on the cotton trade, which in England, especially the north of England, has really boomed, frankly, after the American Civil War, uh, because that has disrupted uh, the, the supply of cotton uh, to the mills in England. And because the area of Greater Manchester is known as Cottonopolis, um, that in in incredible cash-making um, business makes people like Jesse Howarth and other uh, so-called merchant princes very, very wealthy indeed. Now, Howarth doesn't have any children, and he and his wife, Marianne, um, take an interest in Egypt. They read Amelia Edwards' uh, famous book, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, uh, and they take a trip themselves in 1881, 1880, 1881, uh, up uh, the Nile, at least as far south as Aswan. And so Howarth wants to support uh, archaeology in some way in Egypt. He's a very religious man, and he wants um, historical evidence for which we should read biblical evidence. And so Amelia Edwards, through correspondence, gets her very much in her uh, gets him very much in her sights, and uh, co-ops him to support the work of uh, Flinders Petrie in the field. And so it's this Petrie work that's independent of the fund. Petrie sets up his own organisation, the British School of Archaeology in Egypt, and it's this. Um, Petrie-led uh, approach uh, to Egyptian archaeology that Howarth is uh, supporting. And as we'll see, he benefits directly uh, through the division of fines from those uh, seasons. A very little bit of colonial background, because uh, this, is, this is pretty important. Often it is said Egyptology begins with uh, the, the Napoleon um, mission, the Napoleonic uh, invasion of Egypt. Egypt always has this geopolitical importance in, in, the, in the modern world in the last few centru centuries, at least, um, because it has access, land or later um, canal access uh, to South Asia. And for people in Europe, that avoids the trip uh, around uh, the, the continent of Africa. And so when the French invade Egypt, uh, they are interested to describe what they see. And this is often, you know, uh, fated as the, as the scholarly beginning of, of Egyptology, which very much places Egyptology in a European context. Egyptology done properly in its founding incarnation um, is done, it is assumed, in Europe. Of course, there is a whole history of the study of Egypt in Arabic um, from ancient times onwards, but because still most um, non-Egyptian Egyptologists don't read Arabic, 
Uh, this is a, a problem of interpretation, the first of many. So the description, the description uh, uh, de l'Egypte is a survey of the country. It's more than just an account of the antiquities. That's uh, often how it's presented in Egyptology. It's uh, a description of the, the, the flora and the, the fauna and the, um, the average power uh, of an Egyptian man. There is an attempt to quantify uh, the population because Egypt is going to be made productive. Uh, and of course, this, this along with the, the, um, the ruler of Egypt, the Albanian-born ruler, Muhammad Ali, who begins this modernizing dynasty at the beginning of the 19th century, um, Egypt is very much pressed into service and thought of um, as a very, very productive potentially. And so a little bit of, of context about the history of Egypt, which is not often taught in Egyptology programs. I went through my studies at Liverpool for 10 years, not knowing anything about the uh, modern uh, history of, of Egypt, which given it's, you know, it's, it's an example of area studies is, is a little bit surprising. Um, so we have Egypt at the, the center of the Ottoman Empire and the flag of Egypt um, is, is recognizably part of that Ottoman um, Sultanate uh, for many years. Um, the key thing that happens, the key historical moment, I think, um, that, that affects international interest in Egypt is, of course, the opening of the Suez Canal. And we've seen in the last few weeks um, how important still as a, a trade artery uh, the Suez Canal is uh, to, to modern uh, trade and modern shipping. But when it's opened in 1869, uh, the, ruler, the ruler of Egypt, the Khedive, has become bankrupt, essentially. Um, European uh, banks have uh, funded the building of the canal. Uh, the Khedive has, himself has um, spent lavishly. And so Egypt becomes pretty impoverished to these debts, the debts of, uh, created by the, the building of the, the Suez Canal. And those uh, European debtors are extremely harsh in their, uh, in their reclaiming of those debts. So this leads to protest, understandably. Um, led by um, an Egyptian uh, colonel, uh, Ahmed Urabi, a name very significant in the history of Egypt, but rather little known in, in Egyptology. Essentially, this protest is quelled, ultimately, um, in support of the ruler of Egypt by the British. The British come along and they invade uh, in the summer of 1882. And so for the next several decades, Egypt is the essentially ruling power sorry, England is, uh, Britain is the, the ruling uh, power in Egypt. And this, as we will see, this colonial, very strongly colonial context affects how archaeology is done. Incidentally, 1882 is also the year uh, that the Egypt Exploration Society is founded, actually before the invasion uh, in the April. Um, but it's worth noting that, that as a society so implicated in the uh, colonial project of, of archaeology. I'm delighted to say as a trustee of the uh, Egypt Exploration Society, uh, as it is today, um, the EES is very active in, in um, open dialogue and in critical re-examination of its own history. So um, really a leader in uh, the field compared to other uh, Egyptology organizations. But this is really just setting the scene um, for Petrie's appearance. He first goes to um, uh, Egypt at the, in the early 1880s, uh, just before the invasion happens. After the uh, bombardment of Alexandria, uh, Egypt becomes a veiled protector, a wonderful euphemism, uh, the euphemism of, of diplomacy. Um, there's major interest in the, um, in the Suez Canal, as I have said, and keeping access to, to South Asia, but there is also great access in the cotton supply, which is a major cash crop. I think by 1914, 92% of the value of Egyptian exports uh, concern cotton. And so all of this is controlled in Egypt by a gentleman called Evelyn Baring, uh, first Earl of Cromer, who is the British Controller General, essentially a kind of viceroy in all but name. Uh, who, between 1883 and 1907, regulates um, especially the payment of debts between the British and the French. Egyptian debt repayment is, is being uh, managed. 
And so it's very much under this infrastructure of empire that people like uh, Flinders Petrie are operating. And he benefits, museums benefit, the, 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 the West benefits from uh, the so-called fines division, or to give it its French term, the partage system, uh, in which it is uh, decided that up to 50% of material that is found uh, can be exported from the country, while the best 50% is kept by the national collection based in Cairo. And so this fines division uh, system is cooked up basically between uh, Petrie himself in the 1880s and Gaston Maspero, the French head of the antiquities uh, service. So although the export is, is, is legal by the word of the law, um, it is decided by uh, two, two Europeans. And so the nuts and bolts of fines division are very carefully um, recorded in great detail in documents like this. Essentially, yes, the best things notionally are, are, are staying in Cairo, but lots of material is uh, leaving Egypt. And it's worth noting also that Gaston Maspero is something of an Anglophile and is pretty well known as, as being a generous um, uh, giver of, of, of fines when the decision, uh, major decisions uh, come to be made uh, in Cairo. And so looking at just some of the sites Petrie works at around the time uh, Gaston Maspero is in office, um, early on, uh, Petrie has this association with the Egypt Exploration Fund. He falls out with them, as I said, and then he is supported by Jesse Howarth, who we've seen uh, for several years. And this is why, basically, through Fines Division, Manchester has such a significant uh, collection from Hawara at 1888 uh, to 9 and then 9 to 90. Again, uh, Petrie's at Hawara and he goes back in 1910. Uh, but to other sites as well, Lahun, Gurob, Maidum, uh, Amarna, Koptos, and uh, Nagada, all of those sites are very significantly represented in the Manchester collection. This is not chance. I always say this to students in Manchester. The stuff didn't just fall out of the sky into a northern uh, English town. It was paid for, although Petrie was dead against the idea that um, subscriptions were, were purchase money. If you gave uh, a museum, an institution paid a lot of money, whether it was, I don't know, the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts or the British Museum or Manchester Museum or Copenhagen, you got um, a relative proportion depending on how much money had been paid and how much money had been paid by other people. So I would say the lion's share uh, of these, these seasons is being shared uh, between Howarth, uh, based in Manchester, and Kennard. Martin Kennard, another major sponsor, um, whose material ended up in the British Museum and at Oxford at the Ashmolean. So just thinking about the, the site of Hawara, because this Petrie goes there in order to investigate the pyramid. Uh, the pyramid, he, he ultimately proves, belongs to the 12th dynasty Middle Kingdom King, uh, Amenemhat III, but he's also interested in a structure called the labyrinth, um, this kind of fable, fabled um, structure mentioned in Herodotus and other classical sources. So he goes looking for the labyrinth um, and he ends up finding a vast uh, Greco-Roman period uh, cemetery. And he says himself, um, I went for the pyramid, I stayed for the portraits. And it's the fine portraits, I think, uh, for which the, the excavations at Hawara are best known. And uh, among the most striking objects in our Golden Mummies exhibition are those um, panel portraits, those painted in caustic, uh, very lifelike images. So I would recommend if you're interested in Petrie's work and, and uh, his kind of take on his finds, the best way to, to find out more about them is to read the accounts themselves, which for the most part are available as PDFs online. So there are three major publications. Petrie is very prompt in public publishing his uh, finds, uh, very laudable, uh, would that people did the same today. Um, but that speed comes with uh, the implication he isn't able to record things, perhaps as well as he might like. So the accounts in these first two volumes, 
1890, really read sections of them, read like Indiana Jones. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Petrie's um, figure uh, actually inspires in some ways Indiana Jones. But I want to draw your attention to this last uh, one, which is a reflection really on all of the work at Hawara. Uh, Petrie calls it the Hawara portfolio. And his choice of portfolio is uh, interesting as a word because he presents the portraits, these Roman period mummy panels, which he calls portraits, um, in terms that wouldn't be out of place in, in an art gallery. And as you'll see, of the material uh, that ends up in, um, in the UK, a lot of it goes, in fact, not to the British Museum, but to the National Gallery. So the very setting where there is an expectation there are realistic, lifelike portraits of people. There's also a point here about terminology. Uh, often we talk about portraits and masks. I mean, we know now more than uh, ever before that a mask can obscure someone's identity, whereas a portrait reveals the identity of someone. So in ancient terms, uh, these objects, the panel uh, portraits and the gilded masks or painted masks fulfill the same function, but we have these modern terms which uh, draw a distinction between them. So at Hawara, um, Petrie leads, he directs. I mean, there are lots of, of people who are doing the digging for him. He's not, um, for the most part, he's not um, getting a, a, a trowel out and uh, toiling away himself. He's directing the work of, of others. And he has some very selective uh, words uh, for what uh, he finds at Hawara. He does not like these gilded mummies, which form the basis of our <laughs> exhibition. Um, so he says in his journals and in his letters to sponsors, which get very much redacted, uh, by the time he uh, by the time he writes up his reports and then redacted a bit further uh, by the time in, in the 1930s when he writes his autobiography, but you get a real sense of what he's thinking from these these letters. So he describes uh, to one correspondent um, the plague of gilt mummies continues. You know, today archaeologists would be thrilled by a mummy uh, with with a gilded face mask, but now he's he's really complaining. He says wretched things with gilt faces and painted headpieces. He describes them elsewhere um, as gaudy and ignorantly painted cartonages, cartonage being this kind of papier mache um, uh, material, a mixture of plaster and, and linen or papyrus, which is, is built up in layers and then uh, molded and then can be painted or gilded. Uh, these cartonages were probably made by Greeks and not by Egyptians. So Petrie's distaste uh, stems from the style of them. He doesn't like them because they're so late. They're not pure pharaonic. And the more you read of uh, Petrie's, uh, the more you realize he's got a lot of love for high Egyptian culture, um, which he assumes is, is a kind of uh, an, an invasion uh, of, a, of a new race um, itself, but he doesn't like uh, the influence of the Greeks and the Romans. And this is really a theme. It's not so much an opposition of Greek and Roman to Egyptian, because in many ways, uh, people writing at the end of the 19th century would favor Greek and Roman imagery and ideals as a kind of antecedent uh, for, for uh, European empires. But it's more about the idea of mixing. Petri is uncomfortable about the idea of cultures mixing, and that is absolutely what is represented by this material. Um, lots of other people have written about it much more authoritatively than, than I. Uh, my, my predecessor actually at Manchester Museum, uh, Professor Christina Riggs has written a lot about Roman period funerary culture, and it is about a really eclectic, responsive, creative mix of cultures between Greek and Roman and Egyptian that doesn't simply fall along what you might call ethnic or racial, uh, as Peter might call it, lines. Uh, the reality, as so often in life, is much more complicated and nuanced. But Petrie quite tellingly says about these things as he's finding them, <laughs> you can almost feel him rolling his eyes. He says, well, you know, all this, this, this cruddy stuff, I suppose I must bring them all away. 
as they will be worth something in England in spite of their hideously late style, their gilt gaudiness may be very attractive to British Philistines. It's a nice way to describe your sponsors, uh, but it shows an important aspect of Petrie's thinking, which he, he does have an eye on the potential sale of this material and the value of it. He has a monetary value in his head attached to this material. And so some of the things he says, some of the other things he says about the Gilded Mummies and the, 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 the face painted uh, panels are pretty hair raising. So he talks about in 1910, um, Farag, the Arab dealer, had a lot of the common gilt masks at Hawara, such as I did not care to go on looking for. So there are so many of these things He's just, he's not bothered about them. He knows they're there, but he, he doesn't want to archaeologically um, investigate uh, that part of Hawara. He describes many gilt bust mummies, the upper part uh, being the, the part usually that's mainly gilded, um, were left behind because they were mostly too rotted to move. So he's when he does find material, he's abandoning it. And then most hair raising of all to a modern um, archaeological mind. As for poor mummies, without painting or cases, we heave them over by the dozen every day. Now there's an estimate that the, the Greco-Roman cemetery at Hawara contains thousands, thousands of mummies. But Petrie, in his own writing, estimates that maybe only two or three percent are decorated and worth trying to remove or record or restore or give any account of. And although Petrie on one hand is, is very much uh, seen still as a, a pioneer of, of careful archeology span and to an extent that is uh, of course true, he is also <laughs> heaving dozens of mummies over by the day and not making any attempt to record them. Others um, in the, the past 20 or 30 years, other scholars have tried to um, piece together from fairly scant uh, written details, the, the, the development of his excavations at Hawara because he left very little in the way of co added contextual information. A little kind of uh, trigger warning here that um, although you, as you've signed up for a, a lecture on Egyptian mummies, you might, um, might expect that there are images of um, unwrapped human uh, remains. Petrie is very interested in skulls particularly in skulls. He believes that skulls can be measured and can tell us something about the racial origins of the Egyptians. And this is something coming from a place of colonial anxiety um, about who we are, uh, where we came from, how we might uh, differ and what might happen in the future. This very much comes across uh, from Petrie's uh, writing. So he has this set of calipers. Um, one of his students, Margaret Murray, who becomes quite associated with Manchester and mummies, you know, keeps his, his set of cranial measurements, um, which he's, he's very keen on. And just to emphasize, this is not something that happens on the fringes of uh, the British Empire, um, as, as perhaps some imagine. It's happening in British schools in Victorian and uh, Edwardian period. Um, because of the belief and because of the desire that enab being able to track people's skull measurements tells you something uh, fundamental about them and their breeding, and you could selectively breed out less desirable traits in order to use one of Petrie's uh, phrases to improve the stock. And as Caroline already said at the beginning, this is a very unsavory aspect of, of, of Petrie's beliefs uh, system, and it really is a something he is a, a, a significant proponent of is the belief in eugenics that you can change, um, you can selectively breed out uh, certain aspects of the human uh, race. So when he gets to Egypt, and especially at sites like Hawara, although no, not just at sites like Hawara, uh, this uh, skull and mask are uh, from near Abydos, further south. Um, Petrie says, um, especially at Hawari, he also says, um, when he's you know, heaving over the mummies, um, if they're not well preserved, well, the mummy was not worth keeping. But of course, I kept the head for comparison. Because 
Petrie believes there is a special interest in having a representation of the deceased in the form of a mask, a three-dimensional mask, or especially in, in uh, terms of a portrait, to compare them. Of course, this is a major assumption that the masks and the portraits are an attempt at a lifelike representation, which I personally and other people um, think they are not. And so here, in this case, uh, there's a, an extraordinary photograph in the Egypt Exploration Society archive where Petrie, who's an early um, uh, user and, and um, experimenter in photography and archaeology, he attempts something like, or he's certainly aiming towards uh, something like modern facial reconstruction. So he takes two images and kind of superimposes skull on face in an attempt to prove that the face mask matches the skull. Now, this is, is a questionable methodology because, as I say, it assumes there was an attempt to represent the face as it actually appeared. Petrie, even from his, his probably his first meeting with Jesse Howarth, is very interested um, from, from 1887, especially onwards, in uh, racial types. So he is paid one season just to go out and take plaster casts of um, different faces on the monuments of Thebes. And this is uh, produced as a book which has been, if not willfully forgotten by um, some of Petrie's fans, certainly it's not as well known in Egyptology as some of his other works, um, called uh, Racial Photographs from the Egyptian Monuments, 1887. And so he makes charts because Petrie likes charts and he makes judgments based on uh, skull shapes, which are uh, pretty spurious, I should say. He also writes in a book called The Revolutions of Civilization, which is also pretty hair-raising, um, again, rather little known, about uh, what he calls racial mixing, which throughout the whole book, he seems to be arguing for um, that, that people should, should mix, and this is uh, the great strength and a, a great advantage of humankind, but then in the last few pages, he quickly uh, switches uh, tack. He says, yet if the view becomes readily grasped, I'm quoting directly from this 1912 Revolutions of Civilization, uh, that the source of every civilization has lain in race mixture, it may be that eugenics will, in some future civilization, carefully segregate fine races, he says, and prohibit continual mixture until they have a distinct type which will start a new civilization when transplanted. The future progress of man may depend as much on isolation to establish a type as of fusion of types when established. This is the racist language of the, the time to an extent, but it shouldn't be denied that Petrie really does run with this. He believes um, in the improvement, as he said, of the racial stock um, and he wants to see eugenic methods adopted in the here and now to do this. And he takes these racist ideas and projects them uh, back into the past. This is something that uh, recognition of Petrie's eugenicist uh, views is, is not something new. Um, certainly in the last five or 10 years, and material, archival material as well has come to light uh, about his, his significant interest in this um, aspect of archaeology. But for the material at Hawara, for those portraits, for those panels, for representations like this under a beautifully gilded mummy, the mummy of Isaiah, you get representations of enemies. Now, for Petrie, these are, these are distinct racial types. These are um, the idea of non-Egyptians being uh, trampled uh, underfoot um, by the deceased. Now, while that is the origin, uh, of, of um, this style of representation, we have other examples of these Greco-Roman foot cases that say quite explicitly, your enemies are under your sandals and talk very much about the abstract concept of the enemies of the deceased, perhaps even the, the, the concept of death itself being trampled underfoot. So it, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, a good case, quite an illustrative case, of where an ancient idea uh, represented in iconography has been 
subtly misinterpreted by someone like Petrie. Petrie, with his very racial thinking, wants to see these as distinct types of people, when in fact they, they represent a very generic religious concept uh, to the people who are actually producing these kinds of objects in the second centuries uh, CE. And so Petrie uh, influences these idea, ideas, influence the work of Amelia Edwards, as I said, a popular travel writer. Uh, she gives lectures in the UK and in the United States, and these are published in 1891 as a book called Pharaohs, Fellers and Explorers. And this just reflects uh, some of the, the ideas of the time, but seem directly uh, to be influenced by uh, Petrie's ideas. So Amelia describes uh, a portrait, one of these panel portraits, as a plebeian looking boy in whose saucy eyes open nostrils, thick lips and swarthy skin, I cannot but recognize the prototype of the native Egyptian donkey boy of our time. Now she's given to purple prose. She's a writer. Um, she's writing at the end of the 19th century. And there's lots to unpack uh, there. But one point I, I would highlight, these portraits belong to the super elite. Mummification, because these all come from, from mummies, probably painted to accompany the mummy, um, unlike, as, as Petrie suspects, um, he, he, he thinks they were painted during life and they're a reflection of what people looked like. I'm skeptical about that. I think they're uh, posthumous creations. Um, this assumes that the, the people looked uh, like uh, this necessarily. Um, they're idealized in, in certainly, at least in some way, but Amelia's comparison of this incredibly elite uh, person, uh, male, with the donkey boy it has a certain kind of dismissive colonial attitude, which is uh, quite uh, typical of, of a lot of European accounts of Egypt. Um, and she says of this woman, for example, that her features are molded in the unmistakable Egyptian type, because for, for Amelia and for Petrie, people in different parts of the world are conforming to a certain type, kind of unchangeable, unchanging type. You're boxed, you're categorized. The whole expression is of oriental languor. Now, um, this is a very sinister subtext, substratum of a lot of writing about uh, Egypt in the 19th century, but sadly it's, it's the kind of casual racism that, that persists even amongst so-called uh, Egyptophiles today, that people in Egypt are lazy. And it's interesting in the writing of, of the late 19th century, especially knowing the Manchester context where people in Manchester, the people that would come and visit the museum in the 19th century are thought of as working hard in the, uh, in the, in the cotton mills and they, 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 they're the busy worker bees and they're uh, rich, uh, rich from, from industry. But this is subtly contrasted with, with people in Egypt, it is assumed, who are lazy, these ideas of colonial power and um, colonial hierarchy are very difficult to shift and absolutely influence uh, Petrie's interpretation of uh, the portraits. And all of this comes out of the colonial context because remember Petrie's work in the 1880s and 90s and 1910s is possible to an extent uh, because of the colonial hierarchy. Egypt is ruled uh, by, by Britain here uh, in a punch cartoon. Uh, the portly sa sailor represents uh, the British and Egypt is this kind of um, slothful but potentially rapacious uh, crocodile. And it's also interesting to observe that this idea of Egypt as the crocodile tamed by Europe and kind of wrested into um, submission by Europe very much comes from Rome as well. So after P uh, Cleopatra VII pops her clogs, it is uh, Augustus Caesar who says that he's added Egypt, he's captured Egypt, and Egypt is represented on coinage as the crocodile. Of course, many in the British Empire, uh, the, the ruling elite would look back uh, to imperial models uh, from Rome. And so when we look at this incredibly striking, beautiful material, uh, in the Gold Mummies of Egypt exhibition, uh, I think we're caught between two poles. This is what I, I discussed in the last chapter of the book. Mummies, and particularly mummies from the Greco-Roman period, were, were caught between this rapture 
for the, the, the glint of gold or the, the glint of light in the eyes of these, um, of these, these painted portraits. But we're also repulsed by them because they're, you know, human, human corpses. And a lot of the repulsion or the anxiety, at least in, in fictional treatments, and I think it bleeds into and is inspired by um, archaeological and scholarly work, is a, a feeling of colonial anxiety. That these things taken out of Egypt through Fine's division are in some sense um, not meant to have uh, been taken by the imperial powers and should have been left in Egypt itself. So <laughs> these are big themes. Uh, uh, hopefully this lecture uh, might nuance some of the things you see in the exhibition. You can read uh, more about it in, as Caroline uh, said, the catalogue, more than a catalogue, more than um, simply a book about this stuff, uh, but has some beautiful photography by my colleague, uh, Julia Thorne. Uh, published by Nomad Exhibitions at Manchester Museum and available through uh, the, the uh, North Carolina Museum of Art shop. Uh, lots of uh, footnotes there, uh, therein to tell you more about uh, these ideals. So um, if you want to know more, um, please do, please do uh, follow, uh, follow our social media at Manchester, follow the North Carolina Museum of Art for more uh, lectures like this and programming. Um, I'm very grateful for the invitation. And the last uh, shout out, I mentioned it in the lecture, uh, to the work of the Egypt Exploration Society. Um, really uh, uh, sector leading work, um, supporting Egyptian heritage in the field and trying to better understand both um, Egyptian heritage itself and the, the kind of issues that have mediated our understanding like those uh, I've touched on uh, today. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Campbell, for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture, as always. Um, if you have questions, please put uh, your question in the Q&A. Uh, Maria will be feeding them to me, and I will be feeding them to um, Campbell. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. We have a question here that talks about, can you give some examples of European anxiety about taking objects out of Egypt? Yes. Uh, this was um, surprising um, okay. by this particular uh, attendee. Yes, this, this is a, a really good question. I, I alluded to it in the, the book. Um, one of the best examples of European anxiety about material coming out uh, of uh, Egypt is it appears in lots of places in, in, in Gothic fiction. So these are uh, writers, writers like Bram Stoker, he's a good example, who knows lots about Egyptology, he's a kind of amateur uh, Egyptophile. Uh, he may get to corresponding about um, uh, these subjects with perhaps Petrie himself, but he writes uh, a book called The Jewel of Seven Stars. And in it, I mean, it's very orientalizing in, in, in lots of ways, but it, it very much talks about the vengeance. The vengeance of the mummy comes from a place of having done something we shouldn't have done. And it's very much um, voiced from a, a Western, I should say, often upper middle class, male, white, bearded, ostensibly heterosexual point of view. Um, and there is, there's a fascinating, um, fascinating segment in that in which uh, the, the ancient uh, queen, Queen Tera, basically says she, she wanted to be moved to um, England. She wanted her mummy to be removed to England because uh, she, she didn't like it much in Egypt, in her, her home soil, thereby giving a complete validation of the, of the, uh, the archaeologist. So um, I think it finds its, its biggest expression in fiction, in the fiction of the late 19th and early 20th century. Thank you for this uh, very, it's, it's, I think it's really nice when we can connect to like Bram Stoker, for example. Yeah. We, we understand, um, we've read the books. Um, so it's always nice to see um, examples given through uh, things that we're familiar with. Um, I, I sh can I add to that? Sorry, Caroline. Sure, that you why? Know the, 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 the mummy of Ta Sherry Ankh in, yes. the, in the exhibition. Very That's impressive. the last one, the double decker. Yes, the double decker. She's got her coffin. Um, yes. She's Ptolemy. She, there's um, there's a bit of debate about this, but um, 
there is a chance that that mummy was in the possession, well, we know it was in the possession of someone who knew Bram Stoker. So yeah. when he was looking for inspiration for uh, Queen Tara in, in Jewel of Seven Stars, he may actually have been inspired by a mummy in the exhibition. Excellent. Um, we have a couple questions that are very similar um, that ask about how did the Greeks and the Roman view the Egyptians? Um, were they, how would, you know, with the Greeks integrated um, into Egyptian culture more than the Romans, et cetera, that sort of. I think there's quite a, a lot of an, an integr integration. Of course, we can only look at the evidence we have. And in, in funerary culture, it's, it's, it's to a greater or lesser, lesser extent mixed. And it's interesting to see in some contexts where it is very mixed and some contexts where they're, they're quite separate. Um, but in terms of day-to-day -day interactions, uh, I think on one hand, you can have very... Um, yeah, social interactions are very complicated and don't aren't easily accessed through the surviving record. But we do have texts that talk about, you know, land holdings and tax in which uh, certainly under Roman rule, uh, native Egyptian populations seem to be second class citizens in the kind of Roman imperial system. So it's it depends what the evidence is you look at, I would say. I think there was cultural interaction. There's a great appreciation by the Greeks and the Romans for the antiquity of Egypt, for its, its science and its literature and its uh, religious beliefs. But at the same time, you, you read uh, accounts like um, uh, attributed to Augustus Caesar himself, where he's very dismissive about mummification or about animal cults, for example. So like everything, it's complicated. Indeed. Um, quick question. Was Petrie well respected in his own time? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, I think generally he was, but there are people, a, a name like David Hogarth, a classicist, comes to mind, who is quite dismissive of, um, of Petrie, uh, maybe a kind of a personal, personal um, gripe, uh, where he talks about, you know, <laughs> Hawara is supposed to be this great, this great site when in fact there's, it's 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 overhyped basically. So, I th but that's a really important point that I think the whole colonial project, at, at least the, the stuff I've looked at for the British Empire, um, and there's been great scholarship on this recently by by people like David Olusega and here in the UK, um, honorary professor at Manchester, which shows that there was a lot of uh, critical voices. There was a critical voice in the UK for imperial operations. People were not all flag-waving um, supporters of it. And I think um, there were uh, people, detractors of Petrie, who said you shouldn't be doing the excavations in the first place and you shouldn't be um, measuring skulls. Uh, on that really related theme, we have a question that says, how can we move on from this colonial standpoint in Egyptology? Um, we are far more aware of Petrie's eugenic views now. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's not about wholesale cancelling uh, Petrie's, Petrie's legacy, but it's about being more informed, I think, and asking more questions. The more we know, you know, and the more our sum of knowledge is, um, the more nuanced our interpretation of the past is. And working on the, the Golden Mummies exhibition uh, and uh, the book and, you know, conversations we've had, I think the more I, I read of Petrie, the, the more it made me think about my own response to the material. So none of us are looking at these things in a vacuum. None of us have a time machine. We can't go back and see them as they were originally produced or interpreted. I just think this critical re-examination will um, nuance our perspective, which is no bad thing in life and interactions with other human beings. Absolutely, always um, being influenced and um, revising our views, I think is the only way that the field of Egyptology can grow as a whole, uh, that we're not stuck in those 19th century views. And um, so that's always 
um, a good thing. Um, and I, ha I have a question here that I, I will answer if you don't mind, uh, Campbell. Um, yes. There is one, can you explain why there is no mention of the African contribution in ancient um, Egypt? Mm -hmm. And um, I will be the last lecturer in the series of Golden Mummies um, programming, which talks about traditions. And even though we're talking about Greco-Roman Egypt in the exhibition, which is, as we've mentioned, a period of uh, ancient Egyptian history that's often pushed to the side because it is not pharaonic, it is, um, it's marred, if you will, yeah. for once by the European tradition coming from Greece um, and, and Rome, what we see in the exhibition just mummification that cannot be more Egyptian um, because a Roman would never be got dead wrapped up in yes. yes. So my lecture in May talks about those traditions, even though we're in the Greco Roman period, everything is rooted in thousands of years of Egyptian funerary traditions. Um, and that is that contribution um, to from the continent, if you will, that is maintained. It's really the outside of the mummies that look different. The inside is purely Egyptian, African, you name it. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just basically a shameless plug for my lecture coming Which up. Which will be, um, I'm sure, f f fantastic. And to add to that, Caroline, I, th I think it's an important point. Um, Egypt very clearly is in the northeast of Africa. It's an African civilization. It is, it's a geographical uh, fact. And also something I really liked about working on this exhibition, and this is a particular shout out to you, Caroline, we have a, a, some significant material from the Meroitic Empire. And we make the point in the exhibition that uh, Greco-Roman period Egypt has a strong uh, trading partner in um, the Meroitic uh, Empire, which is based in what is now modern Sudan. So there is an accent uh, on that aspect of interpretation in the exhibition. Thank Absolutely. you, Anna Garnett. <laughs> yes, hello, Anna. <laughs> Curator of the Petrie Museum. <laughs> yes, representative from Petrie. <laughs> we right. have. Oh, just thank a, you. <laughs> um, we have just a few more uh, minutes. Um, let's see. So. Uh, a uh, question about a, a person who wasn't sure if she missed um, the answer, but what were the conclusions that Petrie came to about the skulls? Um, he, he didn't publish um, his conclusions because the skulls got uh, mislaid. So he sent them back to England in the hope that they could be compared to the, um, to the, to the portraits and the comparison was never done. So if he had done it, oh, I, I don't know what he would have That is said. sweet. <laughs> yeah, they were only recently in the 1990s, uh, I believe identified in the Natural History Museum. So that, that tells you a lot about museum practices. Skulls go to the Natural History Museum, five portraits go to the National Gallery. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One last question, and I think that, that could be useful for a lot of people. Uh, what book would you recommend for undergraduate students to read uh, on this um, oh. topic, other than your own publication? Other than Gold Mummies, <laughs> the book. Of course, everyone run out and buy it. Um, oh, there's there's there lots of great stuff. Um, two things that pop to mind. Christina Riggs work uh, has, has really addressed some of these issues head on, but the I think the book that I found most inspirational for uh, what we've been discussing today is by Debbie Chalice, and it's called The Archaeology of Race. And it was really Debbie who um, corresponded when we were working on the exhibition. It was she who highlighted the, the role of the racial um, uh, castes and Petrie's ideas. So if you're an undergraduate, try and get hold of that Debbie Chalice book, The Archaeology of Race. Well, thank you once again, uh, Campbell, for the oh, thanks. wonderful lecture, for answering um, as many questions as we could. Uh, Maria, also thank you for all your work with um, the lecture. Um, thanks, Steve. Maria. Thank you. I'm really sorry I'm not, not there. I, I, as I said at the last lecture, uh, Caroline at least and I were able to celebrate the launch in Buffalo. 
uh, with a couple of drinks, but I'm really sorry to be not in North Carolina. But thank you to everyone at NCMA for the chocolate. It's really great, really great chocolate. It is. The best for, chocolate I've ever had. It is. For those of you that are in North Carolina, I definitely recommend you visiting the exhibition and trying that chocolate because it really is fantastic. Have some now. It is delicious <laughs> indeed. And we have all sorts of other goodies um, in the exhibition store as well. So once again, thank you, Campbell. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for this um, third lecture in the four lecture series. Um, the next one is May. When am I speaking again? 13, May 13. <laughs> it's going to be a lunchtime lecture and I will send, uh, it will start at noon p.m. Uh, North Carolina time. Uh, so I will send that information on uh, in the follow-up email uh, that I will send to everybody who registered for this lecture. So I certainly hope you can uh, join that lecture as well. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic, Caroline. And I just want to add thank you to Dr. Campbell Price and thank you, Caroline. And thank you all for That's joining totally. us on this Saturday. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, have a thank nice you weekend. Everyone. Thank you, everyone.